All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Nick Ewell, um, and this is going to be a talk about um, high-level reasons why we might want to compile our code, and also about work that I've done in collaboration with Duncan Temple Lang um, to make compiler technology more accessible to uh, everyday users. So I want to start with an example. Um, the example we're going to look at is a random walk. Say we want to simulate n steps from a 2D random walk, and for anyone that's not familiar with a 2D random walk, the idea um, is that there's like a little turtle on a grid, a two-dimensional grid, and at each time step, the turtle moves up or down or left or right, and it chooses um, by flipping a coin to choose the axis and then flipping a coin again to um, decide whether it's going to move forward or backward. And um, so this diagram kind of shows what the path might look like from that. Um, something to notice is that, the, that it can visit points um, that it's already been to, so it might go out um, to a point and then come back, and eventually it ends up at somewhere like the orange square there, and it has to make a decision for the next step. Um, and the question is, how would you write the code for this if you wanted to simulate this in R? So um, if you took it very literally from the description that I just gave, um, then you might come up with something like this. Um, you pre-allocate some memory um, to store the positions of the turtle, and then you loop over all the time steps that you're going to run for. Um, and you flip a coin to decide if you're moving forward or backward, and flip a coin to decide if you're moving horizontally or vertically. So exactly like what I just described. But the problem with this, as many of you may be aware, is that for loops um, tend to have a performance problem in R. Um, so if you were to run this, if you wanted to run it for a lot of steps, um, it would be quite slow. Um, and this is actually an example um, from Rossi Haka, one of the founders of R, of how we can improve our code through vectorization. Um, so he took this code and he um, incremental, incrementally improved it um, with a profiler until he came up with this version of the code um, that's fully vectorized. Um, and what he's doing here is a little bit different. Instead of um, looping over the steps, he just samples the four directions, and um, then he gets a um, direction of movement for each time, and then he sums up all the directions of movements to get the positions. Um, so the good thing is this is much faster, and I'll show you how much faster in a second. Um, but there's also some downsides here. One is that it's, it's not very intuitive or obvious, especially for someone coming from a different language, maybe someone that's not so familiar with the idioms of R. Um, and the other problem with this is that it doesn't really generalize well. So I mentioned that um, in the simple 2D random walk, the turtle can go and visit points that it's already been to. But if we wanted to change this to a slightly different model where the turtle can't revisit points, um, well, it would be very hard to do with this code. Um, there's no easy way to vectorize that. And we'd have to go back to something like the for loop that I just showed you, and then we'd lose all of our performance. So the question is, how can we make the naive version fast? Because um, we'd really like to be able to write the naive version, not the vectorized version. And the answer that um, I've came up with, um, and many other people as well, is compile the code. So we bypass the R interpreter and translate our R code directly into machine instructions. Now, um, we've done this um, to test it out. And if you look at the vectorized version that was running in the interpreter, um, so Ross's vectorized version, that, that's about 83 times faster um, than the naive version running in the interpreter. Um, and if you go and compile this, you translate to native um, hardware instructions, um, then it's actually about 103 times faster. So the point here is that we can do at least as well as the vectorized version. In fact, we can do a little bit better. Um, so that's great. Um, and now if we're compiling the naive version, then we don't lose performance gains if the simulation changes, and we've written code that's fairly intuitive. We don't have to go and know special idioms of R. But there's a little bit more that we can do if we have a compiler. Um, if we know how we're going to use the results from our random walk, um, say we know that we're only going to use the x positions, and then we're going to do some simple um, statistics on the x positions, well, we can edit our code a little bit when we compile it. And so this all runs ahead of time before we actually um, try to run the simulation. Um, we can eliminate all the computations that don't have anything to do with the information we're going to use. So in this case, we can eliminate all of the computations for y. Um, and if we actually do that um, and have the compiler do it automatically by looking through the code to see um, what variables are going to be used, 
um, then we can increase our speed up to 144 times. Um, and we can go a step further, we can actually avoid unnecessary loops as well. So in this case, um, we have the loop for our random walk, but then there's also an implicit loop in computing the mean and computing the standard deviation. So those have to loop over um, the elements of x um, to do the computation. And so if we can eliminate those, because really we only need one loop, we only need one loop over all the elements of x, um, by combining all of these into one loop, then we can get further performance improvements. Um, and we don't have anything to do that automatically yet, but the point is that there's a lot of ways that we can speed up R, okay? And lots of people are trying to speed up R. Um, so we just saw a talk about um, our engine, which is trying to speed up R, but there's lots of other approaches that people are taking as well. Um, hopefully I didn't leave anyone out, um, but it's very exciting that we've got so many people trying to compile R, and, and these packages are doing um, a very good job of um, being able to compile most of the language or the whole language. But there's one thing about these packages um, that they don't address, um, which is what I'm trying to address. It's how can we make compiler technology more accessible to the average user? So if you have a very specific application in mind um, that you want to build a compiler for, um, it's quite difficult as it stands right now. Um, you need to know a lot about the hardware you're compiling for. You need to know a lot about R. Um, you need to know a bit of CS to understand how compilers are typically implemented. Um, so what we're trying to do is build a toolkit for people to build compilers um, and only have to write R code. So you won't have to be super familiar with the hardware you're compiling for. You might need to know a little bit about the architecture overall. Um, and you won't have to go and learn a systems language like C or C++. So the goals for this project, um, we want extensible tools so that you can do code analysis and build compilers. Um, everything written in R as R packages. Um, we want to be able to export R code to new platforms and other software, so things like um, graphical processing units or um, sharing code with other libraries, and I'll give an example of that in a minute. Um, and we also want to make code more efficient to run in the sense that I just showed you, and also more efficient to write by doing things like automatic translation. So for example, you might have code that could run in parallel, um, but it doesn't because you didn't go through the extra steps to write the code to make it run in parallel. Well, we'd like to be able to detect that it can run in parallel and then automatically generate that code for you. Um, and finally, we'd like to make it easier to extend the language. Um, it's possible to extend the language now. R has great metaprogramming tools, but um, Often it's not as efficient as you'd like it to be. Um, it would be more efficient if we could compile to native code. So just to give an overview of how this all works, um, this doesn't um, completely replace the interpreter. It sits alongside the interpreter. So normally your interpreter would take our code and then it gives you results. Okay. And if we look under the hood, um, it actually parses the R code and then it evaluates and there's other steps in here as well, but I'm just trying to give a, a very abstract um, example of what's going on. Um, and we actually use the R parser. There's no reason for us to replace the parser. Um, so we use the R parser to parse the code and then we run static analysis. We do code analysis. Um, and all of this is extensible so that you can get the information that you want about your code. Um, and then we do type inference because when we go and compile, we need to know about the types of the data that are in the variables. Um, and then finally, we compile the code and um, we get machine code out and then you can run your machine code and get results. So here's a, just an overview of, of the packages that I just mentioned. Um, there's R static for code analysis, R type inference for type inference, R to LLVM is our experimental compiler and I want to stress that it's experimental. Um, you shouldn't expect that you can go and take um, just any old example and run it and, and have it work perfectly. Um, that's not really what we're trying to do. Um, but if you do try it out, um, then please let us know if it doesn't work for you because we're very interested in getting examples. Um, so just as a reality check, there are lots of other people that are trying to take this approach um, with other languages. Um, for instance, in Python, uh, in the Python world, there's a project called Numba where they're trying to co compile a subset of Python code, um, especially things that deal with numerical algorithms. Um, and that's worked very well. And of course, the Julia project as well um, has built um, compiler technology built in. And both of these projects um, in particular use the LLVM infrastructure, which is an open source compiler infrastructure. It's the same infrastructure that we use and it's um, very mature and actively developed. Um, so that's part of why we chose this 
particular infrastructure. Now, compiling is not just about performance. Um, there's a little bit more that we can do with it. So let's say that we have some data in a database, um, and we want to run something, uh, evaluate some function on all of the columns, um, or some of the columns in the database. One way we could do this, um, not a very good way to do it, is we could query the database, pull out the data that we actually want to apply the function to, um, and then um, call the function in R. Now, now, this won't work if you have a database that has a lot of data in it, because pulling the data into R will probably overwhelm your computer's memory. Um, so there, another thing that we could do um, is send the function over to the database and then have the function run inside the database. Um, this is usually called a user-defined function, and many databases have support for this. And hopefully, um, whatever your function is doing, it's going to reduce the data somehow so that when it sends back the answer, um, whether it sums something or computed a mean, um, it's much smaller and you can keep it in memory. So here's a concrete example of that. If we wanted to, say, compute the log likelihood of something, um, we could pull the data out or we could um, register a log in a dx function um, to compute the log and the density um, and then just run it in the database. Now, I haven't said how compilation comes into this. Um, there are packages out there right now that will let you register regular R code, interpreted R code, with a database. Um, for instance, there's the R SQLite UDF package to do this with a SQLite database. Um, but the problem with that is that it runs just as slow as any other R code. Um, so if we were to register an interpreted code or interpreted function with the database and try to run this on um, 100 million rows, um, well, that's quite slow compared to actually pulling the data into R um, and running um, the function there. Um, but we can't do that if the database is even bigger than this. So compilation comes in because if we compile the function and then pass the compiled function to the database, then we get a speed up that's almost the same um, or even better than if we had pulled the data into R. And now we don't have to pull the data into R. I mean, in some cases, for some databases, they may be able to even run the computation in parallel and get further speed ups. So the point I really want to get at with this is, is not just that it, we get better performance, but also that we can um, use our code with new platforms by compiling. So I showed you we can use our code with a database, but um, we can also compile using LLVM um, to create kernels for GPUs without having to write C code. Um, or compile to JavaScript so that we can um, write the logic for our um, D3 applications um, in R rather than JavaScript, um, and also distributed systems and other libraries or, and technologies like Python. So what I really believe is that these new platforms are the next frontier in our computing. We've got a lot of examples of um, people that are trying to build a good compiler for R, um, but being able to run on new platforms, unusual platforms, there's not quite as much that's been done there yet, and this is a really interesting area to explore. I mean, the tools that we're building, we're trying to enable people to do that. So just to wrap it up, um, compiling our code does improve performance, um, and you can use analysis of the code to get additional optimizations, like I showed with the 2D random walk example. Um, but the most important thing, I think, here is that we can export our R code to new platforms um, and other software. So we can send it to GPUs, we can send it to um, be used from other languages um, or other libraries. Um, and I want to emphasize that the tools that I'm presenting here, it's just a toolkit. Okay? It's not a complete compiler solution like some of the other things that have been presented today. Um, but I really encourage people to go and check it out and play with it if you're at all interested in um, compilers or building domain-specific languages or anything like that. We'd love to get feedback from people um, and hear what your use cases are um, and how we can make these tools easier for people to use. Um, so here are some links to um, our packages. They're not on CRAN yet because they're still under heavy development, um, and there's also a paper about this. Um, so thank you for coming to my talk. I think we have time for questions, if there are any.
Hi, uh, looks really cool. Um, how, how do you provide type information uh, to the compiler? What are the different ways of providing the inf necessary information? So actually what we do, um, we use something called single static assignment form, yeah. um, which gives a unique name to each variable definition in the code. Um, right. So by using that, then um, when we run our type inference, we can assign a unique type to each, each of the SSA names. Um, and then it's very easy to connect the types back to where they were, where they belong in the code. Sure, but, but um, how do you get the starting point, right? So, like in the example with the random walk, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you know um, what the type of n was, for example? Oh, okay. Um, so, what we've been exploring is using heuristic rules. Um, basically, we're being speculative about this is how we think our users typically do things, um, and. Based on that, we try to come up with a type. Of course, we also, if we can get something more concrete, um, like a default argument or something, we try to use that. Okay. Um, and we make all this optional so that if it's getting the wrong types for your code, you can turn it off. Um, but um, the idea is that we think that there are certain patterns that our users tend to use. Um, and by using these heuristic rules, then we can get good type information um, without having the user um, have to supply it themselves. Of course, that's another thing that we might um, provide support for um, later on. So, uh, this is a question and a comment at the same time. Um, whenever I see a byte compiler or just-in-time compilers now, um, the typical example that you guys show us is a rather simple loop that is easy to vectorize and it is, has a lot of iterations and then you get a nice speed up, of course. But uh, the, the actual question is, what happens with more or less, and I know it's impossible to, to define that average R code. So I know from experiments in CRAN with um, the just-in-time compiler, uh, for example, that in, on CRAN packages with the vignettes and the example code and so on, we have a speed, an overall speed penalty of roughly three to six percent. Of course, this is also caused by the biased code in the R packages that have a limited um, number of iterations, but perhaps you have some comments. Um, so, um, I'm not completely sure I understand the question, but um, could you clarify maybe what you're... <laughs> okay, to make it simpler, uh, <laughs> what's the average speed gain if you have some, some normal program and not a specific loop that is easy to optimize? Well, it depends a lot about on the, the actual example, what you're doing inside of the loop. Um, so um, just to give a really rough estimate, usually um, we get on the order of 100 times faster. Um, I mean, this, this is the crux of it, right? I mean, how much code looks like this uh, and how often do you get a loop with 10 billion iterations, uh, which um, you know, pays for the cost to compile? Um, and I, I think there's, there's only one way to answer that and it's with benchmarks, right? So um, we, have, we have a library of benchmarks of real world workflow, so not micro benchmarks, but they're on GitHub. And, and basically, um, you know, from the bioinformatics, we're adding them from finance. Um, you know, we have the ML benchmarks from Dortmund, um, and the answer is, it, yeah, some benchmarks, uh, some workloads, some real-world workloads do not absolutely use uh, high iteration loops, and you'll get no benefits from, from a just-in-time loop compiler. Um, we have other tools for that kind of code. Um, you do have benchmarks that have a huge number of iterations, uh, and those, you can see, you can see speed-ups on the performance of 50, 50 times, 60 times. Um, but the, the other thing that I think is that it's, that it's a little hard to benchmark is that we're benchmarking the code that people have written for the current interpreter, right? So if you go into to, uh, Bioconductor, you're not going to find many loops with a, a, hard, a large number of iterations because nobody writes code that way. Code like that doesn't survive. Yep. So um, it's, it's, it's a difficult question to answer empirically. Um, but I, I think we, we, we have a responsibility to do that with benchmarks, um, and, but then we also have to look ex kind of experimentally, what if somebody could have written code like that uh, if it had survived a first revision 
So, yeah, I, I can't offer, uh, no one can offer an average thing. It's, it, it, it depends. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the, the point is that we would like to be able to let people write um, code um, in the, as an intuitive of a way as possible. Um, so, like Alex was saying, many people use these R idioms, um, so we might not see tremendous speed ups for that, um, but we'd like to be able to let people that are coming to the language or writing things in the future um, use a more intuitive form, like a for loop. <laughs> 